Welcome, everybody. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very special event tonight about the geometry of tall buildings. Organized by the CTBUH, Zaha Hadid Architects, and ABB. My name is Katrin Förster, and I am ABB's International Key Account Manager for Architects, which means, in fact, I'm in charge of assisting you. Last October, Viviana Muschetola approached me from the Hadid Architects, who you know very well, approached me and asked me if we were interested in supporting and financing the event tonight. Well, considering ABB's wide portfolio of building automation solutions and electrification products that are essential in every modern building today, I said, yes, certainly we will support you. We are your partner. We are part of the development of future tall buildings and our urban habitat. With 136,000 colleagues based in more than 100 countries worldwide, ABB literally is everywhere where your high-rise might rise. From China to Australia to Brazil to the Netherlands or to the UK. I want you to keep that in mind. Let me now, ladies and gentlemen, ask Viviana Muschetola from Zaha Hadid Architects on the stage. She will be our host of the evening and will introduce our seven highly decorated and highly recognized experts of the evening. Thank you. Welcome, Viviana, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, and uh, many thanks to Catherine and ABB to have believed in this idea for the second event organized by Zadid Architects with the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats UK chapter. So we are very pleased to have this year an additional partner, uh, ABB, uh, and Catherine that believed in our initial talks uh, around the office. So the, the event tonight um, is effectively run by those three parties together, uh, and we are very thankful for the CTBH to have had uh, the, the opportunity to get all of you in this room to join us for this lecture. Mostly the event uh, that is called Geometry of Tall Buildings have been told as uh, a platform for discussion between architects and engineers about the future of tall buildings. Architects are effectively designing form to respond to the surrounding of the buildings, to the social interaction, uh, and to provide comfort for users, and much more. Engineers are responding to uh, wind and uh, loads and seismic, but essentially the structural form of their building should truly uh, connect with the overall essence of the building. The common element in between the two disciplines is geometries, and how do we talk about geometries and how do we develop the geometries of the future. So for today's night, uh, we have uh, a fantastic panels, uh, as I said before, of speakers. They will alternate in between architects and engineers. And you will, um, I mean, I will strongly um, encourage each one of you to please do at the end ask questions to them. Uh, the main challenge for all of us is to see how we go further than a brief, how we can develop ideas uh, for structure and form that are better responding to our current society. So I will uh, ask all of the presenters to stick to the 10 minutes presentation because we want the audience to be engaged uh, in this uh, evening event. Uh, so I ask Patrick Schumacher, principal of Dadi Darker, to please join us on the stage. Thank you. Happy to be here, welcome everybody. So my talk is tectonism in tower design. Tectonism implies that engineering and also I would argue fabrication logics are becoming the stylistic drivers for a new style. 
It's actually a subsidiary cell of permatism you might have heard about, but it's a new stage, the latest stage, which is more sophisticated in the sense that it integrates a lot of engineering intelligence and the latest fabrication intelligences. So I just want to give you an image. You've seen permatism before. It's usually quite diverse and fluid, but it's all nerve surfaces, and in a sense, compared to what is coming here, rather monotonous. So we're having another increase in versatility and also expressive capacity, and that's interesting to architects who actually want to communicate a much more diverse and variegated built environment and uh, with multiple and more diverse social situations, which this new repertoire could deliver. You can see here that this is not just organic forms, which are always the same kind of nerve surface we're modeling, but the geometries are quite particular to the to a particular structural logic, whether it's active bending or an inflatable, which is later on kind of filled with carbon fiber fi fibers, or modular elements which aggregate into some kind of shell tessellation. Uh, so this was Achim Menges, uh, uh, Stuttgart Research. This is Philip Bloch, people we're working with, which is a very particular compression shell logic, sort of thin stone. And what is important about these new techniques, they can take any free plan configuration and then develop rigorous morphologies on top with a very particular overall geometry and, and then also a particular grain of internal articulation, whether it's the reticulation and ribbing of, of a slab or of a shell. And I'm just showing some research projects, which are not their towers, how we start to develop an expanded repertoire which is very much informed by engineering logics and fabrication logics, like topology optimization, for instance, here, <coughs> and then geometric fabrication optimization, and that you get this kind of very rich repertoire of rigorous, beautiful morphologies. Uh, and these are just the kind of research you do at our research group in code, curved folding, for instance, sheet material into sh shell formations, a hot wire cutting, which delivers uh, ruled surfaces, uh, which we can then also print on. 3D printing is another element of this. Tensile structures of various kinds, which are particular, uh, uh, again, uh, equilibrium tension surfaces, the, the, the seaming. All of these things are rigorous and, and, and far less arbitrary and, I think, more characterful and, than the previous repertoire. So the drivers are structure, material logics, but also environmental engineering logics, wind, sun shading, etc., in its differentiation. And there's another project we're doing where this um, new way of working comes to the fore, very, very much in close collaboration with engineers, but our inspiration and interest is the diversity of uh, morphologies and articulations for the sake of uh, really articulating the various environments and distinguishing them and to have less monotony and more variation, but yes, at the same time, a coherency. So when you look at, this is now already the history of parametricism over a series of decades, foldism, blobism, swarmism, and tectonism is, I think, the latest, the latest stage. And the, the lecture here is how do we apply this to uh, towers. Towers, anyway, been the last bastion which kind of brought under the spell of parametricism was really kind of relatively simple and rigid and repetitive forms. We've been working on towers with respect to this principle of parametrism or foldism. And <clears throat> but now the question is, what's the next step and stage? These could be quite complex forms, and we get the degrees of freedom uh, uh, with, with parametrism, but that's not yet tectonism, so we're moving from here to something like this, where the structure comes in and, and uh, still having the same degrees of freedom, the internal complexities, but now we want to uh, not just have surfaces, but particular structural logics, uh, bringing this home and, and adapting to these forms. So also very much simpler forms. We have been for a while uh, interested in expressing structure. We also like to express breezily and shading and other engineering aspects as well as manufacturing aspects. You can see here that the skeleton is very simple, but it is parametric because the um, base kind of increase as the, uh, the elements vis visibly become thinner and the detail of the mo moment connection visibly becomes kind of less uh, strong. So there's a subtle variation and an expression of 
of uh, skeletal logic. And these are additional elements, the kind of things which are on, on site, under construction at the moment. You can see here that these towers are not just extruded up and repetitive base, or, uh, but that there is a very strong evolution from the bottom, middle to the top uh, in each of these towers, which then also invite variant uses between bottom, middle, and top. And then nest then into these skeletons in a kind of correlation between structural differentiation and program differentiation. So I'll just go through a little bit of this, <coughs> these kind of ideas. And you can see here that this is structurally superior in terms of its logic. You don't uh, apply the same um, uh, principles to these very, very differently uh, uh, burdened um, uh, aspects of the tower. Another one is um, environmental um, um, variation and differentiation. So it's a tower in, uh, for the central bank in Iraq. You can see here as we go around the tower, it changes physiognomy and becomes totally closed off because that's where the, the sun hits and then it opens up to the front. So here we have actually structure and, and um, shading as drivers to differentiate the form. And you can see here that the form becomes much more orienting. It's not a kind of neutral, self-similar form from all sides, but you can clearly see in which direction you're looking. It's an, an icon which is recognizable and shows you the, the sky directions. And this is the way we, we're looking at this. So the way this works is that we can use engineering techniques like sun exposure maps and then transcode that into, for instance, the Brie Soleil surface which is differentiated across and will thin out, will also when an, a, a building from opposite casts a shadow, this could be kind of thinning out the louver. So there's a lot of information gathering and communication therefore about what's going around. So on an overcast there you can see the sun, sun directions and you can sense which buildings impact on this. So this is not only structural, but it's also environmental logics which become imprint their character and particular logic onto the uh, architecture. So we, work, we love to work with this. And of course, there's lots of degrees of freedom how you transpose, for instance, the sun exposure map into a Brissolet condition. So how you transpose various ways of adapting the, the structure to the very, very different uh, um, <coughs> stresses which are distributed along the surface. And this has to do, of course, the capacity with the computational empowerment we have and we, we can, that we can actually move away from the era of me mechanical mass reproduction, which has imprinted itself on all modernist architecture. So this is the era of mass, uh, mechanical mass production. And we're moving from that rigid typologies of that era into topological adaptation, much more organic and nature-like. Because also the era of modernism was not only the era of mass repetition, but also the era where you only had very, very few abilities to calculate, and you can only calculate very, very simply decomposed elemental structures, uh, which in them terms are uniform, and then have very, very clear and, and, and a separate singled out system logics, clear nameable systems. And now we're moving on to uh, something much more fluid. So this. Um, decomposition of, of a structure into whether it's a, a, a tube structure, a frame structure, a, a, a variant, and then in details whether it's a, um, yeah, a kind of portal frame or variant, all these phrases and concepts which have very, very rigid definitions uh, and they kind of disappear in systems which are much more uh, morphing from one condition to other and always kind of mixed and multiple and they're full of redundancies. And you cannot track this anymore with simple calculations, but we're using computational techniques to calculate this. So this is the era of modernism, which we're leaving behind. Um, and somehow there was regret that uh, these kind of uh, modernist buildings had, were so kind of faceless and neutral. They didn't have a bottom, top articulation, middle articulation, all the sides were similar. So we actually can bring back a more characterful uh, set of towers, but without relying on kind of invented physiognomies. So this is the way we would, uh, these kind of variations of bottom, middle, top, and the different sides would come out uh, out of the kind of engineering logics. So this is one of the towers I want to quickly describe. In Miami, you can see here that the skeleton evolves and thins out to the top, and that we have different ways of nestling three apartments and two apartments and one apartments in a top space. 
and various bottom spaces uh, fitted and correlated into the variation which the skeleton delivers. So you get this kind of correlation and opportunizing and, and then th these different conditions also express the different program conditions. And I think it's very elegant and beautiful and it's also more efficient than uh, just an extrusion, which is the kind of default condition of modernism. So I want to just uh, quickly uh, click through those. <clears throat> this is happening or similar here where you have uh, a tower where, uh, of course, particularly if you pull in at the bottom where you have only an entrance space and want to leave a lot of space for the ground, how the structure is working very, very hard at the bottom and then as it, as it um, moves up can lose its triangulation and, and, and lighten out. This is a typical condition. And this is kind of a system transformation in the tower, whereas the traditional engineering logic was that you would have to select a particular system for a particular height of a building, and then the presumption is that that system is the same throughout the building. And if you look at these diagrams, you can turn them upside down, there's an patent irrationality and, 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 and everything is either is overdimensioned in such a system, theoretically. Uh, uh, once you compare it and take out the a priori of mass reproduction and simplicity of calculation, you see that these logics are patently irrational compared to what we can do now. And now we're doing much different. We, we actually see that when you let an optimization run that there's a lot of differentiation throughout the shaft of the tower. And we looked at this and can we actually develop a tower which starts as a tube and then shifts into an uh, outrigger system and then to a core system and a pure framing system, for instance. And you morph through all the different systems. <clears throat> so we've done this initially in, in, at the DRL in, in, in London, in, at, the, at the AA, where we have different studies to explore uh, how one would use various algorithms and, 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 and techniques to develop adaptive skeletons. Um, and they're quite experimental, they're quite out there. Uh, and so we're moving from typology to topology, these kind of techniques of topology optimization, we've integrated them at the moment only in smaller objects, in, in, in smaller structures, in the experimental stage, we're scaling up to larger ones. And, and uh, so far, this hasn't arrived at the tower, but this is studies of students uh, where, where, we, where we're trying to this. Of course, we need help of engineers. We're just intuiting um, um, where the rationalities might lie and trying to see how this uh, f makes for an expressive and variegated uh, architectural proposition. We're doing kind of some kind of proto-engineering and probing of a new language, the language I call tectonism, which must be redeemed, of course, in a close collaboration with engineers who have to challenge us uh, with bringing their um, intelligence to the table rather than having the attitude that we give them some forms and they're just kind of then post-engineered. We, this whole idea and um, concept of a tectonism driven new uh, uh, beautiful articulation nature-like relies on a very, very close uh, collaboration with engineers where they take a kind of co-authorship and, and really uh, uh, bring creative constraints to bear and work with us on making these things happen. And uh, with that, I want to um, just talk about that beauty as the promise of performance would also be, have to be revolutionized. So we, this will bring a revolutionizing of our se sense of beauty. And you can see that if performance criteria and expectations shift, what we might, some, you know, what we might have to shift our sensibility from, from left to right in terms of what we find beautiful and what we find vulgar and ugly. <coughs> and, um, it is also happening in, on other levels, and I think it will also happen on the level of uh, architecture and towers, that we need this aesthetic revolution for good reasons, because this is the high performance we should, we should start to love and endorse. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, I want to talk about the drivers. Uh, my my talk is going to be pretty general about uh, distinguishing tall buildings and the approach that we have to take for tall buildings compared with other structures. In tall buildings, the critical activity is structures for 80% of a project time. And that's, that's an important thing to recognise, especially when we're talking about cost. There's only two ways of reducing a project time to build any particular building and starting the structure at an earlier, at, at an earlier stage, hence uh, we look at the green line, and that means that we need to start the building, constructing the building while we're still designing, hence we have early works packages. And the other way is to shorten the actual time to build a building, a tower, hence we're talking about floor cycle time. It's very, very important to minimise the total project time and that, this, that gap of the shortening is dollars. When you're talking about a 100-storey building, uh, that every month is 1% in a 12% per annum environment in terms of the total cost. And unfortunately, the developer takes note of that, and we need to not lose sight of that. The second thing that I want to talk about is structure, the structural system. And when you look at a structural system, the cost per square foot for floor slab is more or less constant, no matter whether you've got a 100 storey building or a 50 storey building, it's virtually the same. For the vertical elements that just resist gravity, they increase slightly, because for a 50 storey building, the 100 storey building, the bottom 50 storey buildings have to carry the top 50 storeys. So compared with a 50 storey building, a uh, 100 storey building, the vertical system is a little bit more expensive. But the dominating cost is the cost of structure to resist lateral loads, represented by the yellow there. So when you look at a 40-storey building, 80-storey building, a 120-storey building, the cost per square foot increases dramatically, no matter what you come up with. It's a fact of life. And we sometimes deal with clients that are doing their first tall building. They actually think in terms of buying bags of rice that if you've got double the number of storeys, surely it's going to be cheaper to build a, a storey. And, of course, that doesn't work. And I think we can't lose of that, uh, the sight of that. Uh, in terms of lateral loads, without getting into too much detail, there are two components. Uh, because that yellow that I showed you before, that's the cost. We want to minimise the cost of the lateral system, and that is dictated by lateral loads. And I'm only going to talk about wind, because we don't have too many seismic activities in the UK. But you've got two types of components to a wind load. One is static which is associated with the sail area. The bigger the building, the bigger the load. But the more dominant component is a dynamic component. And that depends on the dynamic properties of the buildings, and that's very, very complex. And hence, we tend to deal with wind tunnel testing to measure the dynamic loads. Since wind acts in any direction, by deduction, that we like buildings that are reasonably symmetrical. Uh, we still like to be adventurous, but the taller the building, symmetry is very, very important. And the structure to resist the uh, wind loads has to be symmetrical as well. It tends to be located in the centre of the building, or it's concentric with the centre of the uh, building. So it's very, very important in tall buildings that architects and engineers work together from day one. And all the uh, amazing stuff that Patrick has come up with, it's fantastic, as long as there's a little bit of engineering input from day one, uh, as opposed to coming up with a building and then for the engineers to make it work. Uh, and having that little input at the beginning, in terms of VT, vertical transportation, mechanical engineer, structural engineer, just a little bit of involvement around the conference table for a few hours can do amazing things. And from experience, uh, We've come up with many, many towers that are really optimised in terms of cost just for that initial one week input at the beginning of the day that the architect conceives an idea. I mean, the difficult parts in tall building design is where an architect comes up with a, a great concept and the Mr Chairman loves the concept and there's no engineering input in it and that becomes a problem. It's hard to correct an ill-conceived building, especially when it's a tall building, without cost penalty. There's good examples in terms of uh, the importance of wind loads. 
There are twin towers on the right-hand side there, identical, except they were orientated 180 degrees out of, uh, out of phase. And one of those towers, the wind load is double compared with the other one, just due to the dynamic, the aerodynamic uh, characteristic of the building compared with the prevailing wind. That converts to a $10 million difference in the cost of the structure for the, uh, for the uh, east tower compared with the west tower, just due to the orientation. Here's another building where we had to, uh, we had to uh, work on an existing tower that's half built and the developer wants to increase the uh, height of the building by another six levels because there's money. Uh, that extra six level is going to uh, get about another two or three hundred million dollars located in Mumbai where real estate's very expensive. And of course we had to minimise the wind load because the foundations are already built. And by just tweaking the uh, facade that you see in red, by putting some uh, disruptions to uh, disrupt the dynamic properties of the wind and to reduce the dynamic component of lateral wind load, we can reduce the wind load by 20 to 30 percent. But this involved involving the wind tunnel engineer, the architect and our structural engineers working together right from day one. And when you think about it, uh, when you're designing Ferraris and sports cars, uh, wind tunnel testing is there right from day one. Why don't we do that for our buildings? Uh, we tend to introduce structural engineers, wind tunnel engineers, too far down the track. Uh, by putting, having them involved right from day one, and the developers paying that little bit of extra money, uh, you can do amazing things. And the architects can come up with some amazing structures. Cost modelling. 90% of tall, super tall towers that are on the drawing board never get built. 50% of that 90% is probably due to the fact that a developer doesn't have a clue about tall buildings and has never done some cost modelling. You know, we constantly get asked how tall, what's the optimal height of a building? Well, it's far too complex. Uh, it depends on land cost prices, uh, it depends on interest rates, a uh, whole lot of factors. Efficiency, floor efficiencies. You can do a whole lot of modelling and there is an optimum height for every building. Um, and that needs to be determined right from day one and that needs to be told in the brief to the architects and engineers. Shape and form, well, there are the five images of the current tall, top five tallest buildings in the world that are either being constructed or, or completed. And you look at the shapes, they're symmetrical, they tend to taper because a taper compared with a constant, uh, constant floor plate for say a 120 storey building, the taper will probably reduce the wind load by to one ninth uh, if you take a simplistic, uh, a simplistic uh, mathematical uh, correlation. Uh, a taper, a cone compared with a cylinder can reduce the wind load to only 10% of the overall wind load. And so that's a huge reduction, and hence the reason why you get shapes like that. There are many other shapes that are on the drawing board, but these buildings will not get built, I can assure you. And these are real buildings, uh, but uh, the cost we just, well, uh, they'll go broke, the developer will go broke, and we have a social responsibility to tell the developer that they will go broke. Giant leaps in computational uh, power, digital engineering. The way we design is going to change. There's no doubt in my mind that in another five to ten years time, an architect, engineers are all going to sit around the conference table and are going to develop a concept very, very quickly. You know, I come from log tables, slide rules, calculators, and now we're in the world of digital engineering where in our office we have these things called hackathons and I don't quite know what they are, but all these bright young students are working together and coming up with some amazing, so amazing solutions in very, very quick time. Morpheus, uh, it's a Zahadi project, probably the most challenging tower that we've ever built uh, or designed. It's been pretty amazing. We were given a task, I think we were meant to be designing this in one year, and we made a conscientious decision that we cannot design this in one year unless we spend three or four months just developing software, uh, digital engineering, developing the software 
to make sure that we can design those 2,000 joints which are quite all different. And we did design that software, and now we can design all the connections, even if Zahadi decides to change the configuration, we can rerun the program and within one day we can have drawings, drawings, design and drawings uh, produced. And it's pretty amazing and that's the way the world's heading and so all the projects that Patrick showed are all now going to be feasible. Uh, however, we still have to address the cost. Someone has to pay for it and the occupant has to pay their returns. So if a developer does have the ego to build these buildings, uh, there has to be someone with an ego that's going to live in these buildings. What Patrick didn't tell you, that this project probably quite expensive, but there is a casino at the base that funds it. And the winners from the casino are going to stay in the hotel, and the losers will be staying in the hotel next door. <laughs> so, amazing project. Uh, in fact, there was only two RFIs for the connections uh, for this particular project, because it's digital engineering, it's exact, and so there's no issues. Collaboration is a winner. All the stakeholders are very, very important. This particular project uh, was nearly seven years ago, and this shows you what collaboration between the stakeholders can do. We were locked in a conference room, a hotel, a very nice hotel, uh, engineers, architects, cost consultant, the contractor. The contractor was asked that can you shave $300 million off a $1.3 million budget? And the contractor said, yes, we can. Give us a million dollar fee and we'll make it happen. And so, so I won't go through in detail, but we reduced the number of piles with geotechnical engineers involved. Uh, we took the glazing up, glazing off from the top of the 500 metre high tower because no one can see whether that's got glazing or it's got no glazing. So it reduces the wind loads by 10, 15%, which has an implication on the structure. Uh, we changed the structural system. If you look at the right hand side, we changed change the beam configurations. The weight, the tonnage was, wasn't saved. There's no savings in the tonnage, but less cranage because less number of units. And so that's shaved one day off the floor cycle time, hence time is money. Uh, we, lifting strategy was rearranged uh, in coordination with the architect and the VT. Um, with that, and we rearranged the core, talking with the architects, v, uh, MEP engineers, uh, structural engineers, and we created the yellow. The core was reduced by the, uh, by the yellow uh, area, and through that we had additional letable space, which generated more capital. And so at the end, the original, original tender bid was $1.3 billion, and with collaboration, we reduced it to $1 billion, saving of $300 million. Real money, because a contractor signed up on the million dollars, uh, uh, sorry, a billion dollars. Unfortunately, it was 2008, global financial crisis hit, job never went ahead. But the the response is, the answer is that we did, through collaboration, you can save a lot of money. Okay, I'm going to whisk through this. There's another very super tall tower um, through very early involvement in the structure, VT, MEP. We come up with a very good solution in one week for a concept competition. And, and you can see that the building is symmetrical, architecturally not bad and there's sensible floor layouts to match the usages. This is my favourite project. I, I have no involvement in the project, a successful project, because architecturally it's a fantastic building, structurally it's a fantastic structure, and the developer is making money, and the community is benefiting. Why is it making money? Because this developer is not just building a very tall tower, it's building the infrastructure around the tall tower. It's increasing the value of the surrounding buildings. The surroundings is increasing the value of the tall building. It's reportedly that the observation deck on this tower is generating enough money alone to fund this building. I think something like $100 million per annum. And what a success. So there's the future. Uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, 
uh, I'm pessimistic about super tall towers. I think uh, the focus is going to be more on the usage, the final occupants, and, and how they work, how they live. Uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, they're going to be nicer buildings, but I am very, very pessimistic about super tall towers. Um, that's my view. Thank you. And I just want final comment. <laughs> I just want you to read that comment because us engineers, we also think it's an art and we love to be involved at an early stage with our, with our creative art architects uh, right from day one and I think we'll come up with some better performing projects. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kai Bergman with uh, Bjarke Ingels Group, or Big Architects. And uh, this is our office in Copenhagen. We actually opened an office here in London um, just a, about five, six months ago, a physical one. Uh, we've, of course, been in London for the last year and a half uh, with the opening of the Serpentine Pavilion and then uh, with the work that we've been doing on, um, on King's Cross. Uh, King's Cross is an interesting uh, building, I think, because um, it's 11 stories, um, as King's Cross is kind of thought of as a, um, as a new district, a new neighborhood. But actually, it is comparable to the height of the shard laid on its side. That's why it's sort of also gotten the name the Landscraper. Um, and it has the same kind of complexity, I think, uh, both structurally as well as... Uh, uh, mechanically, um, and this is a little bit how we also think about our work, um, and also when we do work uh, in tall buildings, is the regions, the climates, um, the the sort of site um, informs how we actually design. And I'm going to show sort of a, a, a range of projects from sort of tropical environments. Uh, to more temperate ones and then to arctic ones to kind of really get a feel for uh, how we think. And it's probably best uh, put by um, Bernard Rudofsky who uh, had an exhibition at the uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, called Architecture Without Architects. And uh, the idea here is that uh, modernism, as Patrick also uh, eloquently stated, really was about sort of designing a very sort of sameness, an extrusion, um, a, a sort of principle built on that we can change the environment uh, of the locations that we were building. So no matter if you were building in Brazil, uh, uh, equatorial uh, Brazil, or, or in the Middle East, or wherever, uh, the buildings looked the same. The amount of glazing was the same. The, uh, the four facades had the same kind of expression. And what we, um, and, and there's of course a lot to learn from that in terms of just the efficiencies, the structural grids, all of those things. But what uh, Rudofsky was really uh, thinking about was we can also still learn a tremendous amount by the vernacular architecture, how uh, people build uh, to a specific site, to a specific uh, uh, need and a climate. So when you look at the architecture that's sort of, and the built environment that just sort of uh, is built out of these needs um, and the shapes that actually are derived from that, uh, that's really the, I would say, the two kind of parts of uh, a modernistic sort of uh, heritage that we've grown up in and the adoption of the vernacular to kind of create a vernacular 2.0 uh, in our work. And even more uh, importantly for us is uh, putting uh, engineering without engines, the idea that you could actually create buildings that aren't reliant purely on uh, changing the humidity, the heat, the cooling uh, of a given uh, building, that you really think intelligently about uh, what is a given climate and working within that climate. So we're going to start in the hottest sort of uh, uh, areas that we're working, which is Shenzhen. Uh, and this tower is actually just 
uh, sheathed. Um, it's still yet to open. They're still doing some interior work, but it's a um, headquarters for the natural gas company of Shenzhen. And I find it really interesting that a uh, basically a, a, a power um, entity, a municipal power source, actually had a brief that said, uh, you need to cut our energy bill by 30%. And uh, so we had to prove in the design process that we could actually match that. The idea here was to design a project that, uh, very similar to the bank in Iraq, looked at actually the solar orientation. It looked at not taking in the direct heat that would be coming in from the south uh, and uh, looking at a sort of serrated edge that is both opaque and clear, and that towards the north you have the views out of the building. So it's really thinking about the four facades around these buildings, uh, looking at how we could uh, have indirect light bounce into the spaces, um, and then still create actually shared spaces where we perhaps pull back the facade to allow for a more generous view. Uh, and you can see here where we sort of uh, do uh, work with the facade to allow for entry, at the ground level or um, have sort of communal uh, floors where there's cafeterias and meeting rooms um, where, where people can also go and enjoy the, the larger views out to the city. But it's, it's really a building that kind of uh, opens itself as you walk around it uh, and has this ability to sort of have that uh, same um, uh, sort of complexity um, as you sort of see a tropical modernism, I think, um, is, is how we see it. Um, moving into more temperate uh, climate, we're back here in New York, and I think one of the most important things is to know that we are here tonight at the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. That urban habitat and creating a habitat that actually supports the urban life and breathes allows for the density in the tall buildings to actually be successful. Uh, if it is purely about tall buildings and you place one next to the other, then uh, Lower Manhattan's a perfect example of that you actually reduce the quality of life because you have less light, less air, less sun. Um, and that's the type of thing that I think that symbiosis of thinking about the urban environment is uh, super important. Take a look at New York here. This is 1930s. The entire waterfront is actually uh, commercial. You actually didn't want to live on the waterfront. Uh, you wanted to move away because that's where trains were. That's where things were uh, taken off the ships. Uh, people died uh, literally from, from freight trains that were running on the street level. And so that's why also Central Park became really the, the area in New York, the green line, was more valuable than the blue line in New York. Um, what's happened in the last sort of 10 to 15 years is a shift uh, where now large stretches of the uh, coastal area are all being sort of uh, created into parkland. And this is uh, now also spurring on the density along the edge. So suddenly the blue line is becoming actually more uh, interesting and more valuable than the green line. And um, I, I find that the sort of thinking of how uh, the Superstorm Sandy hit about five years ago and that the entire city went down, $20 billion worth of, uh, of damage, uh, 200,000 people lost their homes, um, sent a sort of shock wave through the city. And uh, we have been um, asked to sort of look at 10 contiguous miles of Manhattan coastline uh, to actually create a flood prevention system that at the same time creates that urban habitat that allows for the density to actually uh, grow even more. So we have this bridging berm that protects against sea level rise. We have a, a park, I'm sorry, a bike lane that goes around the uh, circumference of the city so you can ride your bike for 10 miles and not cross a single street. Um, and this kind of urban furniture is here to actually protect against those uh, climactic conditions that will occur. So just on this exact uh, uh, area or this ribbon of parks that you see happening on the west side 
is uh, our first project in the United States, which is VIA. VIA is a residential building that is uh, right there located on between West 57th and West 58th on the Hudson River. And it's 705 apartments um, and then also a, a retail base. Um, on top of the retail base, we've created this uh, a courtyard and the courtyard is exactly uh, 13,000 times smaller uh, than Central Park. So we looked at both the proportions and the programming to bring that kind of life into the center of the project. Uh, one of the reasons that we looked internally as opposed to externally is that on the north side, we have a 1930s power plant by McKim, Mead and White. And on the south, we have a trash distribution center where every trash dump truck actually goes in. So not necessarily the nicest neighbors. And therefore, we like looked at a way to actually internalize the, the views and the program. But it's the same width as a city street. So it's 60 feet from side to side. And this kind of um, uh, court scraper uh, where you at one end have the height of a handrail and at the other end you have a 44-story building. That kind of court scraper and that kind of carving out of public realm um, and creating that in addition to the other park and the other sort of flood protection that was happening at the same time was an idea of how we could actually bring that into the, into the uh, uh, city grid so that the, that the uh, coastal protection isn't something that just happens on the outer edge, but actually starts to also percolate into the, uh, into the city. And uh, you, you're living in the middle of Hell's Kitchen, uh, and you hear birds chirping outside your window. So really a, a very different type of uh, sort of living. You can see the arrangement here in terms of two double-loaded corridors. Um, it was very important for the client to only have one entry, point of entry, which would have had a reception desk, so we did that on the short end. And um, yeah, it's a rental building, 80% market, 20% affordable. I know that here in, in London, you're uh, discussing exactly these issues right now with the new, uh, with the new planning that's happening. Um, in, a, in New York, it is something that has been uh, very important in allowing for the different neighborhoods to have um, a, a very sort of striated feel. Um, we are also working on the spiral. Uh, the spiral is for Tishman Spire. I say this because Tishman Spire owns the Rockefeller Center. And for me, the Rockefeller Center is a, a, an amazing tall building that also creates an urban habitat uh, through all of its terraces and then the top of the rock at the very top of the building. So from 1930s, the, in, the inclusion of public art, the ice skating rink, the, the kind of dimensions and proportions and scale, the uh, gardens that are still kept uh, absolutely pristine and people using them and programming them is a project that I think is, is really vital to New York and it's also vital to Tishman Spire. So uh, we looked at this site right adjacent to Hudson Yards. Uh, it's exactly where the uh, High Line ends and we thought of this idea of taking the High Line into the skyline, uh, allowing for a, a sort of a spiral of terraces to move up the building so that every single commercial floor has the ability to go outside. Um, again, something that's uh, not really been seen or done before in New York. Um, and this is a way for us, to, again, to connect a high-rise building together with its urban habitat. So the gardens are uh, moving up and spiraling up, but it's not only about being outside. Uh, we're also very interested in how the outside and the inside work together and then how you can actually tie the floors together to create uh, connections that, uh, that people can sort of activate and, and move up. So this is a project that's now under construction, just started uh, moving the, the earth. Uh, Pfizer, the medical pharmaceutical company, is, uh, is taking a third of the building. Um, we're moving now into Canada where uh, when you look at tall buildings, um, they're often, of course, uh, on very particular sites in the city. Uh, however, the flat iron is super interesting because it was a, resi a residual space, a space that was kind of left over by the way that Broadway slices through the grid of Manhattan. And here, no one really built these triangular sites 
because they didn't really make a lot of sense as five, six, or eight-story buildings. But with the invention of the elevator and reinforced concrete, suddenly those residual sites in the cities became buildable. And uh, that's how you sort of developed uh, um, these, uh, these uh, structures like the Flatiron Building. I think we should always be looking out at how technology advances and look for those materials that suddenly allow us to rethink about our residual spaces in cities today. So what can one do with carbon fiber that one can't do with steel or, or glass? And um, in Vancouver, we took the flat iron building and created the fat iron building. So uh, it's a project that's under construction right now. It's a residential project. And then at the base, it's an uh, office underneath the, uh, the, the sort of split uh, Granville Bridge. Um, and here, everything is sort of driven by uh, code and by zoning. We, were, uh, we had to have a certain setback away from the street. Uh, but then we just sort of negotiated with the city that that setback didn't make any sense as an extrusion. Why couldn't we actually take over the space above our, uh, basically, airspace? The city approved. We increased the unit count by 50%. The client is extremely happy. And we found ways with our, uh, 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 with our engineers, Bro Heppelt, uh, to find ways to actually uh, build and, uh, and do this. And so as much time has been spent on actually the lower buildings, the office buildings, to create sort of internal courtyards, and then to activate the space underneath the bridge, which is usually like leftover, again, space in most cities that, uh, that usually people don't actually inhabit. We, we create a sort of Sistine Chapel to uh, modern photography and create these light boxes underneath the bridge uh, that the different uh, uh, Vancouver and Canadian-based photographers can show their work. Here are just a couple of snapshots of how that's actually moving up in the city skyline. Um, same client, and, I, and I'm really happy to say that we're working with the same clients in a lot of cases. So for Tishman Spire, we're doing three different projects. For uh, West Bank, we're doing four different projects uh, across Canada. And when you go to a place like Calgary, it's a boom and bust kind of economy. And uh, it's a very typical American city where you have all office downtown, and then you have the suburbs spreading all around the city, and there are people driving in and out of that city. Very few people, if any, live downtown. So we were approached by a uh, phone company, Telus, a mobile company, who uh, only wanted, they only had an office building that they wanted to fill. They didn't want any other leasers. Uh, but it only would be uh, tall enough to be kind of like a, a, a wimpy uh, tower. They wanted to be, have a presence on the skyline, but they didn't want to have any other tenants. So what they decided was to take a chance, take the suburbs and stack them on top of the office building. So uh, we looked at what is the perfect office building depth, what is the perfect housing depth, and then basically morph those two together. Uh, in the morph, those three or four floors, those are the amenities for both the office and the housing. And we then also look at sort of solar orientation, make sure that it's got the, uh, both the views and getting the sun, and then we pixelate uh, the housing so that each uh, unit also has an outdoor space. So this is also under construction and uh, is going to be uh, topped off at the end of, of this year. And to finish off, um, this is a project that many people probably don't even think of as an office building or as a tall building, but it's actually 400 people working inside this power plant. It's the tallest structure in, uh, in uh, Scandinavia. And it's uh, the entire sort of uh, side over here on the right, that tall facade, is all a, a row of office buildings or offices. And so the idea is like how to actually think of even our infrastructure as an opportunity to create both urban habitat, but also how you can integrate uh, uh, office and the functioning of a power plant, in this case, a waste to energy plant. So we graph that ski slope on top of the power plant to give it uh, an amenity back to the city. And, uh, and then the idea that you can sort of shred uh, your snowboard during the day, uh, you have night skiing, 
you have the world's tallest uh, climbing wall, and uh, that this is actually being built. Uh, we're finishing it up in October. Uh, the, the snow uh, landscape is being placed on it right now. And I welcome all of you to uh, go to Copenhagen in October and uh, ski in the flattest country of Europe. Thank you very much. So, good evening, very warm welcome from my side. Um, I am not an architect, I'm an engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, and I want to talk with you about uh, smarter buildings. Um, we heard a lot about uh, skeletons, we heard a lot about the top, the bottom, and the middle of a building from Patrick, and I want to speak a little bit about the backbone of a building. Um, yeah, let's start our journey with a quote from Le Corbusier, a house is a machine for living in. And I guess you all know this quote. And if, if you read through and uh, study it further, then you find the following. A house is a machine for living in. You employ stone, wood, concrete, and with these materials you build houses and places. That is construction. And we heard a lot about modern constructions, about modern forms, about the modern approach in this uh, context. And for me, the last sentence from Le Corbusier in this uh, uh, quote is very important. Modern life demands and is waiting for a new kind of plan, both for the house and the city. Um, and this interaction between a, a building and the surrounding and the environment and the city um, that will become more and more important when we talking about smarter buildings, smarter communities, and smarter cities. And now, if we are um, uh, we are not living in 1923, we are living in uh, in, in 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 2018. And here I have another quote from a trend uh, researcher from the Netherlands. And she stated, the internet has changed our world. It affects our work, our private life, the interaction with technology and our thinking. An important role in the future is the enjoyment and the fun factor of technologies and its compatibility. And if we now bring these two aspects together, architecture, smarter buildings, internet of things, then we are talking about uh, bringing the earth and the cloud, bringing the building and the cloud together, and that is what electrical engineering engineers doing at the moment. They connecting the buildings to the clouds and the clouds to other clouds and the clouds to the cities and the clouds to the environment, and that is what we call smarter cities, smarter communities, smarter buildings. So, but be, be, before we uh, take off for this journey in, in, in the here and now, uh, let's have a look back where this all is coming from. So it is not new that you need an uh, electrical infrastructure, that you need a backbone in a building um, for electricity, for water, for wastewater, for gas, for all these uh, uh, kind of energies. Um, uh, what is new is that you combine these together with uh, the information. So you have not uh, only a backbone for this uh, uh, energy, you have also in, 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 in later buildings a backbone uh, for, for information. And uh, what you see here is that it all starts uh, before 1960 with uh, mechanical and first electrical revolution in, in these buildings. And today and tomorrow we are talking about the smarter buildings, smarter communities, smarter cities, smarter societies. We are talking about services, artificial intelligence, about uh, algorithms and about robots. And all this together will create a new uh, way 
uh, how we live, how we think, how we will act. Everything will be connected with everything and also our uh, buildings and, and cities will uh, interact and will uh, um, uh, exchange information. And all this is uh, possible because uh, the uh, world is changing and I have here some uh, uh, statements from uh, researchers about what will happen with electricity and the demand of electricity and what they are forecasting is that the demand of uh, electricity will grow by 90% till 2014, and that is really a huge amount. 2015, almost all electricity will need to be generated from clean sources. That is where engineers are working on, and, and that is really important that we find solutions for clean energy. Um, there will be more than 33 billion connected devices by 2020. 2020 is only two years from now. Um, we expect information at the touch of a button, and 2030 robots and artificial intelligence will support us. So that is the challenge. That is our challenge for the future. And if we combine these concepts with the uh, breathtaking concepts from the architects, and from the planners and from the developers, then we are in the future. And the future has already started. 70% of the world's population will live in smart cities by 2020. That is coming from, uh, from the UN. Um, so there is a need for the smarter cities, for the smarter infrastructures. There is a need for exchanging information. Nobody uh, uh, can imagine a world like we have it today where you are uh, driving from one uh, traffic jam to the, to the next. That makes no sense. And if the urban areas get more and more crowded, if more and more people living in these urban uh, areas, in high-density buildings, in tall buildings, um, if they work, and, and we learned it uh, here from, uh, from, uh, um, uh, from Canada and, and from US, that the people live in the, uh, live in, in, the, in the outside areas of the city and work, that means a lot of traffic is going in and out. And that need, there is a need for a lot of communication. Um, so there is a direct need to connect the buildings, the place where you work, and the place where you live with the infrastructure of the city. Connected building market will be worth more than 730 billion with a growth rate of 30% per year. That is another forecast. So you see there is a huge demand of smarter buildings, of bringing intelligent solutions and bringing the information and the building together. So that is, there, there is a question mark. Is it a, more a revolution or evolution? You can make the decision by yourself. A true change affecting building owners and constructors, um, that, is, that is pretty clear. Uh, buildings must adapt to new internet and service rules. So without adapting buildings to this new environment, to these new challenges, um, I, I can uh, predict that uh, these buildings who are not intelligent, who are not smart, who are not connected, will lose uh, uh, asset in, in, in the future. So uh, a, a building in the, which is future-proofed will be a place for digital natives, will be a place which is connected and secured and will be center of interest for, for the people who are living in this building. And building value is changing corresponding to the usage value. And the usage value is not only coming from the uh, form, it's not only coming from the ar architectural uh, points uh, and, and from the architectural um, things, it is also coming from the way how you can use the building, how fast the building can change, um, how fast you can uh, change and adapt the building to different, um, uh, to different needs. 
So Smarter Building, always think ahead, ABB, and that is my company, creates a future of buildings with smarter solutions for more care and efficiency worldwide. So uh, that, that, is a, that is a promise, and I will show you some examples where we did this. So we have a long history um, of uh, doing uh, uh, intelligent buildings, and I, I have two examples with me. Uh, two out of uh, 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 a huge amount of references which we have. One is from 2013, and that is in Australia, that is the AN Tower uh, in Sydney. Um, and what is in from ABB? There is a KNX uh, lighting control system in, there is a building management system in, um, and there's this building um, uh, is designed to save energy on one hand and bring in comfort um, to the people who are working in this building. Um, another uh, reference, which is uh, uh, quite new, is in, in, in Dubai, uh, United Arab Emirates, and that is the so-called Volante Tower. And, and the Volante Tower uh, is located in the Dubai business uh, bay neighborhood, um, it's a 36-story luxury residential buildings. And I was there, I was visiting these luxury apartments, and um, yeah, so the master bedroom, I can promise you, the master bedroom is more huge than uh, average flat here in, in, in London. <laughs> so the, we are talking about uh, apartments with 1,000 square meters, and the price is starting by 10, 10 million US dollar. Um, yeah, and this building is 100% equipped with ABB technology. So we are doing this uh, intelligent backboning. We are doing the uh, lighting control. We are doing the HVAC control. Um, and we help the, uh, the owners uh, of the building to save energy. So that is all KNX based. So if we are now looking a little bit more systematically and asking the question, uh, what makes a building smart today, then, um, and that is, that is a kind of tradition, uh, automation of classical building functions is are controlling light, blinds, temperature, music. So that is state of the art. Door entry system, security, access control, voice control, energy management. So th th that is all state of the art. And what is coming now is that we bring these buildings into the internet of things and services, that we bring these buildings